Thank you very much and welcome to the second part of the second day of this workshop. We are going to have Wendy here talking to us about the product market, the labor market and the economy as a whole. I would say this is my own experience teaching the labor market is perhaps one of the most difficult concepts. So I'm very glad looking forward for this talk. And just uh, some housekeeping, we are, uh, we are going to finish at 4.30 and we are definitely going to finish at 4.30. We're going to try to finish a bit earlier, so no worries, we have to catch trains after that. We're going to make sure that you are able to do that. So thank you very much, Wendy. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, so it's, it's amazing that um, it's, it's great to see so, uh, so many people here um, towards the end of the workshop. So uh, as is often the case with this project, we, we are doing things really uh, on a just-in-time method. So we're at the moment um, in the final stages of preparing the 1.0 version of ESPP, which will be available for teaching in, uh, in, in the autumn, and there'll also be a, a physical book available. So we're sort of all systems go. Uh, but what that means is that we are actually um, literally writing stuff now. So, uh, so this discussion that I'm going to put, put forward today is something that uh, didn't exist uh, a week ago. Uh, so so that's, why, that's why you're here, I hope, to, to help and provide some feedback. So uh, what I want to do is to, is to try and share with you a kind of revelation that uh, struck, struck me and Sam when we were working on this, uh, the, the, the new version of Unit 8 in ESPP, which is the equivalent, uh, it's sort of the partner of Unit 9 in the economy. And in, in both of those uh, existing versions, it's called something like the labor market. Okay, so now we've suddenly realized that actually, uh, it's not, uh, it should not be called the labor market. And what it is, is the product market, the labor market, and the whole economy. And one way to think about it is that it's cause alternative to consumption, production, and general equilibrium. And the consumption, production, and general equilibrium model is represented very uh, graphically by Irving Fisher's uh, water model. Of, of the economy, which, uh, which is featured in, I think, unit three of the economy, and maybe unit two of ESPP, right? So uh, you'll, I know you'll want me to have a nice uh, core visualization, but you, know, you can treat that as your challenge. And uh, it would be very nice if uh, maybe not a water-based model, but some model that captured uh, how, how we're uh, putting together the different parts of the story. Two models that dominate uh, the teaching of introductory economics. The first one that Margaret uh, discussed yesterday, supply and demand, a model of competitive markets that's typically uh, the centerpiece of the micro that's taught to beginning students. And the second is aggregate supply and demand, or ADAS, which is a model of the whole economy. And the point about both of these models, and some of you will have uh, possibly taught both of them, is that they're both like this, right, or like this, and that you spend most of your time shifting around the curves. And the idea for students is that, or the, the idea they seem to get, is that that's what economics is about. So the question that they then ask, especially these students who've spent time really learning that very well, how to move around these curves, is when, when they begin with the core course, they say, but where are supply and demand? And I think the, uh, what we're trying to convey to students is that, of course, the forces of supply and demand are absolutely central to our understanding of how the economy works. But we shouldn't think that because the forces of supply and demand are very important, that the intersection of a supply curve and a demand curve is an adequate way of representing how the economy works. So uh, I think we need to kind of make that, that mental shift. Of course, we're not throwing out supply and demand, but we're throwing out the obsession with having two curves named supply and demand 
And those of you who've taught ADAS know just how crazy that is and how it kind of leads students into really poor thinking because they think it's just the same two curves being moved around. Uh, a challenge to these two models comes from some data that looks like this. So the, uh, this is, these are data for the US. So the, the red line or orange line, as it, as it shows up here, uh, shows the Gini for income, income inequality. So we see it rising, the kind of familiar uh, figure that we know. And the blue line is the, uh, the, the markup, OK? So that we are seeing two things, two big changes happening in the, in the US economy. And we are now actually, uh, the people who are producing these data have, have expanded across the world. And um, we can look at series, not just for, for the US, but, uh, but, but more widely. So a model of uh, a competitive labor market a model of ADAS simply has no way to get a purchase on increasing monopoly in the economy or on increasing inequality. And these are two big features of the world in which our students live and which it would be uh, really great if we could um, bring them or show them a way to go from uh, data like this, which are often in, in, in the headlines, to the modeling that they're learning in class. So this is uh, uh, the challenge. And we are, we, we've responded to that by moving away from a very reduced form um, uh, kind of modeling to teaching a structural model of actors who do things, who actually set prices and wages. Uh, this is going to enable us to have a seamless way of moving from micro to macro that also integrates a treatment of inequality. It can address those two, uh, that, that very vivid uh, data that, 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 I, that, that I showed you before. So this is a kind of preview of where I hope we're going to get to. So we're going to... Uh, present some theory, um, what I'm now calling the labor and the labor market and the product market, or the labor and the product market. And this is going to be about the wage setting curve that, you, that, that we've already seen. It's going to be about the price setting curve. Uh, this is the model of the economy as a whole. The second piece of theory that we're going to connect directly, we're going to derive a Lorenz curve um, directly from the model of the whole economy so that we can not only talk about unemployment, what's going on with unemployment in the economy, but we can also talk, of, talk about how that's uh, expressed in inequality. So we're going to go from here, where we can see explicitly what happens to unemployment, and we can see explicitly changes in the markup, and we can translate them into, um, into shifts in the Lorenz curve, and students can calculate what happens, for example, to the Gini coefficient in, in this model. And then they can think about the facts, right? So motivate with the facts, go to the modeling, and then return to the facts and ask the question, uh, is this a good model? How far does it get us in trying to understand these facts? And you know, stimulating the curiosity of students to not just kind of swallow it, uh, but also to be to respond critically to 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 what they've been presented with, so that's that's kind of lays out uh, the story that I'm going to try and tell. In the equivalent workshop uh, that we had last year in Bristol, we had a session on how how does core teach macroeconomics, and I would um, if you're if you're teaching uh, parts of core that somehow would be uh, thought of as macro, dealing with the economy as a whole, then you might want to have a look at that uh, session on the, the virtual workshop. You can find the sections very quickly. You can speed it up if you get bored. Um, but I would also recommend it because uh, two other people, I uh, contributed to it, but two other people did. David Hope, who is a, one of the authors in the core project, who's taught it at KCL for several years. 
um, and uh, Gonzalo Paspado, who's, who is a TA at UCL. And he really, Gonzalo really gives the TA perspective on teaching this model. And so you don't have to look at anything else. You can just go straight to him in that virtual workshop. And I think you'll get a lot of insights, especially if you're, if you're uh, finding this challenging. So um, this, yeah, so this is uh, the model. Um, this is a slide from last, the last workshop. So I'm just um, putting it up in here. I've already pointed out we're going to show direct links to inequality. We're going to, so this is what's covered really in units 13 to 15 and unit 17 of the economy. Note those of you who are using ESPP that there are 12 units of ESPP. So what comes after 12? 13. Excellent. Not an so, so, <laughs> so you can go straight to unit 13 of the economy from unit 12 of ESPP. So it's designed to dovetail um, from ESPP. Um, and because the macro units of the economy are very policy focused, it's very suitable for a policy oriented course. OK, so um, we uh, talk about the, the structure, structural unemployment, which I'll come to. And obviously, in, that, in the, in the uh, macro context, this is the inflation, inflation stabilizing unemployment rate at the Nash equilibrium. Uh, it's it's uh, the Shapiro Stiglitz model is behind all of this. We talk about cyclical unemployment. This is Blanchard Kiyotaki, Dixit Stiglitz. That's the the, if you like, the research analog of, of the model that we're using so that we have aggregate demand-based fluctuations around structural unemployment. We have a bargaining gap-based Phillips curve where we derive the Phillips curves sort of not out of thin air or not just sort of empirically, but we derive them from the wage setting and price setting curves. And uh, we have movements along the Phillips curve um, arising from fluctuations in aggregate demand. So the bits all fit together from the very uh, first micro steps of the firm interacting, the owners interacting with the employee up to, uh, the, up to inflation and then macroeconomic policy, which again you can think of as being presented in the simplest kind of Clarida Gali gertler way of a three equation model with a goal oriented central bank. So the feasible set in difference curves are uh, used in the presentation of the model of the, of the central bank, just as they are in so many other settings in, in the text. So that just gives you a kind of really quick overview. And it's talked about in more uh, length at the, in the virtual workshop from last year. OK, so back with what I really want to focus on uh, today, which is, which is much narrower than that. What I want to do is to try to pull together what's in Unit 6, the firm sets the wage, what's in Unit 7, the firm sets the price, into what is in Unit 9 or Unit 8 in ESPP, which is now called the labor market and the product market, unemployment and inequality. It used to just be called the labor market, and I'm going to try and convince you that It'll probably even help you understand the model better is having a new title, somehow giving equal weight to the labor market and the product market. The, uh, the way that we approach this overall view of the economy, you could say, has kind of classical roots. And um, on the one hand, uh, uh, so we, we bring together, if you like, classical views of uh, structural views of in income distribution thinking on the one hand of capital versus labor, the Marxian tradition, and on the other hand, the firm versus consumers, the Smithian tradition. So both of those are really embedded in the core approach to the economy as a whole. And again, that's kind of, that's, a, that's the way the thing works. You know, wherever the ideas come from, if they're good ideas, then we should put them together and, uh, and use them. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that, then I'm going to, uh, okay, I think I probably won't go through the outline because uh, 
We just want to get there. At the very end, because you think I've, I've uh, it's been false advertising, I think the original title for this session was about uh, modern monopoly. Um, that was before we had this kind of big idea. And I'll come back at the very end to give some comments about modern monopoly and where you can find resources, already existing resources, resources in core. So these are the two views, the capital versus labor, Marxian insight, and the Smithian insight. And it's both of those that we bring together to characterize the labor market and the product market uh, in, uh, in the economy as a whole. And that's thinking like this is the explanation, if you like, in two bullets of why we have a model of the economy as a whole that is going to be intimately connected with income distribution. OK, so that's, if you think like this, then it's not so weird that in the model we're going to be able to talk about that rising uh, genie and the increasing profit share or markup. At the heart of uh, this, this way of thinking is a new benchmark way of thinking about the firm and, and, how, uh, and what the firm is like. And we move um, to a model on the right that we, that we saw yesterday where the, the benchmark model of the firm is, is a firm is one with constant costs and downward sloping demand. And that's what pins down the size of the firm. So the opposite is the standard benchmark, which is this benchmark, which is obviously a bit of a problem in a price-taking world. How on earth do you pin down the size of the firm? Well, you have to work really quite hard, and it's fairly complicated to understand it. But if you start having these U-shaped cost curves, then even though you don't, you don't find many of them, it's like a theoretical solution to the problem. So we're going to set this aside, and we're going to focus on that as the uh, the benchmark of the firm. Joan Robinson should be credited with this. So it was Joan Robinson and, and Chamberlain who developed the, firm, the theory of monopolistic competition. And given our e e extraordinary paucity of women in The Great Economists, Joan Robinson will be joining Ellen Ostrom um, in, the, in ESPP. So we have a nice... Um, a great economist segment on Joan Robinson, uh, contributed by Beatrice Cherry. Now, this is contributed by Sam and Simon Halliday. Uh, it's it's in, their, in their draft of their intermediate micro book. And it's all about how very, very difficult it is to find uh, examples of rising costs in firms. So this is just a huge, long set of uh, um, empirical studies. And if you look very, very hard, you can find an example of slight diseconomies of scale. You can find some uh, occasional cases of, um, of rising costs. These two examples of the, the M20 tank built by Ford, this is a learning by doing example. And this is, uh, this is the um, uh, solar panels, right? where we're all benefiting from this extraordinary fall in prices, fall in costs. OK, so that's just to, if in some sense, say this is what we should be talking about. If anything, the cost curve is going down, but a flat cost curve is, is good enough <coughs> for, for what we want to do, and it makes life much, much simpler. You saw this chart yesterday, which tries to characterize the, com the contrast between the old benchmark and the new benchmark. And I've just uh, really focused um, in terms of the new benchmark for the firm. What we're thinking about in terms of technology, so in the old benchmark, exogenous with decreasing returns. In the new benchmark, endogenous with constant or increasing returns. And competition, uh, we've uh, emphasize that. OK, so now what I want you to do is to uh, sort of come on a, a, a journey to, to visit the labor market and the product market. And then we're going to put them together in our model of the economy as a whole. <clears throat> and what's new about this, so some of you have taught this in different configurations, uh, but what we hadn't done before was to show 
the, the really parallel structure of the argument and the even-handedness of the treatment of the labor market and the product market when we put them together to think about the economy as a whole. So this is about the firm in Unit 6. And here we're talking about the problem being faced by the human resources uh, department in the firm. And their job is to set the wage in such a way that uh, workers are useful to the firm because they supply sufficient effort to allow production to take place. So this is the model that we've, we've seen uh, a number of times. And the connection I want to highlight here is the connection between the decision by the human resources department in a firm and the economy as a whole. So we're comparing here two best response functions for two different rates of economy-wide unemployment. And that's what allows us to connect the decision, the, the wage setting decision in the firm with what's going on in the aggregate economy. So when the um, un unemployment is higher, there's a much bigger pool of unemployed in the economy than the reservation wage falls and the wage that's going to be set by the firm, <coughs> sorry, the wage that's going to be set by the firm in their profit maximizing decision is lower. So that's what takes us directly from points A and B here to points A and B on the wage setting curve as we move from unemployment of 12% to unemployment of 5%. So we're literally moving from the actors making their deliberative decisions, in this case in, in interacting with each other, to translating that result into an economy-wide wage setting curve. And uh, the parallel story is to think about the, uh, another part of the firm, which is the marketing department. And the marketing department's job is to set the price. So uh, the constraint that they face is the demand curve. And they, they have to make their decision given the wage that's being determined by the, uh, the HR department. Uh, and the technology which they learn by talking to the uh, production department. So they have all the information they need in order to, uh, to set the profit maximizing price. So what we're going to do is to uh, show that when we bring in the macroeconomy to think about a positive demand shock in the macroeconomy, shifting the demand curve facing the firm, then we're going to in exactly parallel way, construct two points, and from that, the price setting curve in the economy as a whole, in just the same way that we did when we constructed the wage setting firm. So the students, again, getting the payback from investing in understanding this model and mastering the isoprofit curves, uh, they get the payback that that's just not, not just a story about uh, firms and competition and so on, as, as Mar Margaret discussed yesterday. But it's the foundation for the other part of the story in the model of the economy as a whole. So let me um, just go through this a little bit step by step. So OK, this is, um, this is just the firm setting the price. So the firm sets the profit maximizing price. We went through this example yesterday. What's the information? The constraint, the feasible set, is determined by the demand curve. The, the, the marketing department has to take the nominal wage, productivity, and the, uh, the competitive conditions, which are captured by the markup, uh, into uh, so the elasticity of the demand curve into account. And they're going to set the price here. The, the thing to do, I think, with students in this case is to use a numerical example because they can just plug in the numbers. It's really easy, and they can, they can figure out everything, everything to show on the picture. And you can give them another example and make sure that they've actually understood how to do it. That was point A, right? So this was point A here. And with, using just exactly that information, we can calculate the price setting real wage by dividing the nominal wage by the price. And that's going to give us 1.5. OK, the productivity is 2. So we can literally 
okay, just from those numbers, get the implications of the profit maximizing price set by the firm, what's the implications of that for the real wage in the economy as a whole? And it's called the price setting real wage because it comes from the firm setting the price. Right? So that's what it is. It's as simple as that. And again, you can plug in all the numbers, make sure everything works out, but average productivity is being split between uh, profits per worker hour and wages per worker hour. You can manipulate it in all sorts of different ways to bring home the message to students. To uh, come back to the point yesterday of how do you teach about the isoprofit curves, one way to do it <coughs> is to write A is the profit maximizing price, but how should you really get the intuition for students to think about it? So one way to do it is to say, we'll start here, where you, we think of setting the price just at the, at the, at the level of costs. Right? So this is the, the average cost curve here. Well, obviously, you're not making any profits. Right? So, okay, that's, that's pretty pathetic, right? I'm not in business for making no profits. So you think of just walking up the demand curve, just conducting little mental experiments. Oh, that's really good. My profits go up if I increase the price a bit. Keep doing it. So you're passing these contours as you walk up this hill. Keep going, right? Well, you can still make more profits by pushing the price up above that. Once you get up to here and you start pushing the price up, your profits start going down. So thinking of the isoprofit curves as contours, thinking of that mental exercise is not such a kind of crazy idea. Someone was saying this morning, how does a, how does a, a businessman, a businesswoman, a business person actually think? Well, they think something like that, conducting these little um, mental experiments. OK, so this is, uh, we can put the two things together here. And then we say, right, let's uh, increase demand. Let's have an increase in demand in the economy as a whole. Now, you're saying, well, we've just got one firm here. So the simplest way of doing this is just to have one firm in the economy. Right? Obviously, once the students have got the idea, then you can say, well, that's just one among many firms. And then you can introduce to them the complication that the, the, the real wage that the workers are going to care about is going to be W divided by the consumer price index. So you have to have all the firms having set their prices before you can talk about that real wage. But just to get the idea, it's perfectly fine to start with just a firm. Having the demand curve shifting. Now, the thing you notice immediately is that because in this very simplest model, we want to keep the markup unchanged, then the demand curve has to become flatter as it shifts out. Okay, so that's going to mean that the firm doesn't respond to fluctuations in demand by changing its price. And we have all kinds of different stories that we could tell about that. But it makes things very simple, very easy, and you can show it in um, in, in the diagram. That gives us this second point. What this is really saying is that the price setting curve is kind of really boring. It's just a number. And somehow explaining a number is quite hard for students to get. So explaining it by deriving it from, from this and showing them how to do the calculation to calculate the real wage is equal to 1.5. Uh, when that's at both points A and point D, then, sorry, then uh, I think they, they then get it more, or they're likely to understand it better. Right, so that's, that's, uh, that's basically the story. The, the labor market, the product market, we get them to think about what's happening above the wage setting curve. So, the HR department says we're paying more than necessary, so cut wages. Here, workers are not doing anything. We can't produce, so you've got to put wages up. So you can talk about what's, what the dynamics of the model are here. Similarly, above and below the price setting curve. Right. So the marketing department says up here, if the real wage was here, if the price that delivers that real wage is here, the markup is too low. We can make more profits by raising prices. So that's the two elements of the model. 
And then we put them together. So now this is the labor market and the product market. It's not just called the labor market anymore. So that's, that's the existing old figure, snipped, right? The new figures, of course, have not been created because they haven't been done yet. Um, that will now say equilibrium in the labor market and product market. And X marks the spot, and that's, uh, that marks the, the intersection of these two curves where nobody can do better, can do any better, and that, of course, they're very familiar with as the definition of the Nash equilibrium. Okay, so no one, so no HR department, no uh, employee, no unemployed person, no marketing department can do any better than at that point X. Right. If, uh, if, if wages are the only cost, which they are in this case, then the markup is the profit share. So we can very simply go from the, uh, the equilibrium here of the labor market and the product market to construct the Lorenz curve. So look, here are 10 un unemployed. Here are the unemployed here, right? This is the, yeah, so we've lost, this is one zero, that's 10, it got squashed, and that's 90 here. Uh, so so they, in this uh, uh, little example, they're not getting any un unemployment benefit, so they're not getting any income. Then this is the wage share, 60%, and that's giving us a second point on the Lorenz curve. <coughs> That's the profit share. Okay, so back to the, uh, to the data. Here are, uh, so the, the, someone asked this morning a really good question about why, why somehow the, the Shapiro-Stiglitz model had, had dropped out of the research literature. And one answer to that question is data. And the two papers that Sam put up this morning are, uh, illustrating that now with so much better micro data uh, that those theories can now be tested empirically. So we, we're beginning to see research um, uh, that we can refer our students to using examples and we already do that in the economy um, because we've got such micro firm level data. But another research tradition is underway uh, using micro data in the article by uh, Barkai here on the profit share and here by Lurke Eckhout, my colleague Jan Eckhout, um, on uh, measuring markups using microdata from around the world. These are, these are data from the US. So again, we didn't have the data. We didn't have, if you like, the, the goods uh, to, to be able to really marry together the model with the, with the data. Uh, and this, this stuff has kind of arrived um, uh, in a way that makes it much easier to motivate this teaching. Some people may think that the US is a very competitive economy, and he, these data on broadband, broadband prices by country help to illustrate that that is a misconception. And yeah, lots of people who know about the US are kind of nodding sagely. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, obviously we can just um, manipulate the model. This, is, this example, uh, which is in the economy, is looking at an increase in competition. So if there's an increase in competition, then uh, the, uh, the price setting real wage shifts up. So the equilibrium shifts from A to B, and we can show that what that's gonna do is to shift the kink, the second kink, and shift the Lorenz curve in so that the Gini coefficient declines. You can give students these things to calculate, and they, they can confirm this connection between what's going on in the labor and product market model and uh, how to show that in terms of inequality. So this is the opposite case, right? So there's a decrease in the extent of competition faced by firms. The price setting curve shifts down. We should have a prediction here, not only that, uh, that there's increased inequality associated with this, but also that there should be increased unemployment. But 
all the students read the newspapers, they listen to uh, Donald J. Trump, and they know that unemployment is very low in the United States. So we've had an increase in markups, an increase in profit share, but historically low unemployment. So how could that be? How can we use the model to respond to that, uh, that question from students? So the, the answer to that question in, in a purely geometric way is to, uh, is to think about what's, what's been happening to the wage setting curve. And they also know that there's been a weakening of trade unions and of the safety net and that there's also been the emergence of the gig economy which has reduced the reservation position of workers so that uh, the, we have a whole lot of reasons consistent with the model why the wage setting curve will have shifted down. So that we can perfectly well have a situation where we've got this really tremendous increase in inequality. It's not being contributed to by rising unemployment. In fact, unemployment can even, as illustrated here, be lower than, than it was initially. So the effect on the Lorenz curve, the wage share falls. There are two effects, okay, going in opposite directions. Unemployment falls, but you can, uh, you can illustrate that uh, the, the wage share effect, if you like, the monopoly effect outweighs the unemployment effect and gives you rising inequality. Right, so this is where I started. I've shown you this before. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of closure, the closure of the steps, which says, right, we've given you a, some, some data. We then put together a model. And then we can throw it back to you and say, well, how good is this as an account of, uh, of the data that you've got to begin with? But at least now you have some tools with which you can discuss this analytically rather than just raging about the uh, the, the uh, monopoly uh, strength of the, of the big tech companies and other companies, for example. Okay, so that's all I wanted to do on the, the labor market, the product market, and the whole economy. But I also wanted to just draw attention to some thinking that we've been doing about how to characterize old versus uh, modern monopoly in terms of the characterization. So here in the old monopoly, it was basically uh, stable competition among the few with a downward sloping demand curve. And the whole point was that the harm was in terms of the price, price prices being set above marginal cost and extracting consume, con uh, consumer surplus. Either that or some combination of that and the survival of high cost firms. That's the old monopoly. And the remedy was to restore competition, breaking up uh, large firms, imposition of price caps, um, public regulation or ownership of natural monopolies. The, the, the modern monopolies are different <coughs> in, in, in character. We have the situation of high first copy costs, but with zero or low marginal costs. So that has a really um, substantive impact on our thinking about harms. Because how can we think about the harm when the price is zero? So our, you know, our mentality about um, what's wrong with modern monopoly requires us to think differently than, uh, than just, just to apply the rules from, from the old monopolies. And what that means, of course, is that we have to think in a somewhat different way about the remedies. It's absolutely not clear that you just want to break up these modern, modern monopolies. What we want in, 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 in uh, so I was very struck yesterday by the slide that Luca put up with that, do you remember that slide that was completely covered with logos of all the ed tech firms that are out there? And someone sitting next to me said, Antonio I think said, well, if we're here in two years time, then there'll be two firms left or one firm, right? That kind of mess of all those different firms will have, will have disappeared. And that's, you know, that's a really interesting characteristic of, of modern monopoly, the question of whether it's actually serial mon monopoly, um, and, and uh, our need to think about more carefully about um, the implications of winner-take-all competition and of the harms that come with that. 
Uh, this is uh, to indicate that we do have some resources already in the core um, ebook in the economy, Unit 21, Innovation, Information, and the Networked Economy. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. There are some good models, that, teachable models. Here's the case of winner take all, uh, the, the value of belonging to a network, and this is the, um, the, the beta max versus VHS, the video wars. Uh, so we've got a, a simple model of how that played out. And we also have a model of a two-sided matching market. So someone again said yesterday, well, all the students know about is Instagram. That's, you know, they don't really know anything else. That's their life, Instagram. So that's a platform. And, and it, it would, it, it's nice, again, to be able to take to them a model that they can understand to think about why there are likely to be three equilibria where there's no provider. We do it, actually, uh, with Airbnb where there's an unstable equilibrium. So here is the one stable equilibrium where there's no market. Here there's an unstable equilibrium, and here you move to the case where you have a giant um, uh, platform that is monopolizing this, uh, this, this market. And that's it. So thank you. <laughs> you're, you're stunned into silence. Yeah, them are speechless. <laughs> when you mention uh, that price goes down when the competition increases, why is that in the moment? In it's a trivial question, but it's an important one that students are going to ask. So sorry, say say it again. In the model of labor, combined labor and product. Okay, let's go. Let's go back to the. So we we know what we're talking about. Okay, you're nearly there. Okay, so you're saying, so, okay, let's look at this one here. Forward. We started talking about oh, it's the illustration. Yeah. 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 We said let's illustrate with the increased competition. Yeah, here we go. Increase in competition. Right. Yeah. Increase in competition, <coughs> then the effect of this increase in competition is prices go down, like in the traditional. It, absolutely, and, and that pushes up the real wage. So the price setting real wage goes up. So the students can really understand that, that consumers are going to benefit from that, workers are going to benefit from that in terms of higher real wages. Right. My question was more about why is the price going down when the competition goes up? Isn't that referring back to the traditional supply and demand framework? As I said, the forces of supply and demand are in full swing. Okay. No, wait, wait a minute. All that Wendy said is that as competition increases, the electricity of demand increases. Yeah, which is the same thing. That's what lowers the market. But it has nothing to do with supply and demand in terms of the... Yeah, it has nothing to do with... Not at all. I mean, it's, it's just Chamberlain Robinson. I think the confusing point is that the previous slide had an unchanged price. So probably but that was about an other... Yeah, 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 exactly. That was a different experiment. Yeah, so that was not about... Uh, that was about an increase in economy-wide demand facing all firms. Okay, so that was this one here. Uh, this was deriving the price setting curve. Okay, this one here. So this was just uh, uh, assuming that you've got, um, that, that we've got an increase in demand. So either facing a, a representative firm or a, um, if there's just one firm. The markup doesn't change then the price, the price won't change. Okay, so then the different experiment, and that's very good that you've raised this, is that uh, when we get to here, when we talk about an increase in competition, yeah, then we then the question is now we've got, suppose we've got the possibility of entry, for example, into the market then that's an increase in competition. Say we open the economy, or you can think of any number of ways of motivating this. And then the, uh, the markup is lower. So we're just using the absolutely standard uh, derivation of, or definition of the markup, which they've seen in unit um, seven. 
Right. So the markup <clears throat> is lower because the prices are lower, right? Am I understanding correctly? The mar So, Margaret, do you want to? Uh, no, so I, I thought you were trying to. Depends on the elasticity of demand. Okay. Absolutely, the markup depends only on the elasticity of demand. Okay. Okay. The elasticity of demand represents the extent of competition in the market. Okay. Okay. So it's so the markup is P minus marginal MCOs. cost over P, okay. which is equal to one over the elasticity. Okay. So that's that's all that we're doing. All that we're manipulating here. And we're saying that this increase in markup is, uh, is representing a fall in elasticity of demand uh, in these industries. You can do exactly the same thing with a Cornell model, in which if you have some barriers to entry, if you lower the barriers to entry, you end up with a larger number of firms and a lower price. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter really which of these models you use, because they all work in the same direction. But for students, it's really, in this uh, representation, because there are so few parameters that they have to think about, uh, they can literally derive what the implication is for the, for the real wage because, for example, of a change in the elasticity of demand. And that's the... Uh, that, that's the... Uh, I think uh, it would be interesting to have have people's comments. So Steffi said, okay, this, this thing is kind of hard to teach. Most people find the wage setting curve is very natural for students. They find that, uh, they actually find the model of the, if you like, the HR department pretty straightforward. They've experienced what it's like being, getting a job. Uh, they know people who've had, had a job. Not, not everyone has had any experience of, of a firm deciding what price to set. So they're sort of, that's a bit outside their uh, their experience, and I think that's part of why motivating the uh, price setting, even though it's conceptually easier, because there's no strategic interaction, uh, somehow motivating the price setting and then translating that into a real wage is the is harder for students to to get. But why we've motivated it here by the data and the change in um, in markups and in profit shares is because that is something they kind of feel. They kind of know about that out there. And, and therefore, being able to see that turn up in the model is, I think, a help to understanding how it works. Is that the existing Chapter 9 already? <clears throat> no. Some of this is. This, this particular picture is in existing Chapter 9. But the thing that's not in there is the thing I showed you, the putting together the two, uh, this. Okay, so doing the parallel story between the, uh, the price setting curve and the wage setting curve. So the micro and then the macro is, we haven't explicitly done that. It's in there, but it, we've not explicitly done it. And if you go on to unit um, 15 and do the um, inflation, then the, the, the price setting in some ways then becomes much more natural because you have some fluctuation in demand, you open up this bargaining gap between the wage setting and the price setting curve. The, the HR department puts up the wage, otherwise it can't get any work out of the workers. That pushes up, pushes the profit margin down for the firm, so the firm marks up that cost increase, and that's how you motivate inflation in the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve drops naturally out of the, the wage and price setting. Okay, there is one <coughs> question back there. Are we not assuming a constant markup throughout the whole model? Yes. And why do you say before that markup changes? Okay, no, sorry. So for a given, a given competitive landscape, then the markup is constant and we can have fluctuations in demand in the economy as a whole, okay? But that doesn't preclude the possibility of, if, uh, of structural changes occurring over time of the sort that we appear to be observing in the data, right? That have got nothing to do with cyclical fluctuations, but are to do with structural change in the power of firms vis-a-vis -vis their, their customers. Okay, we have Sam. Uh, 
Um, it's, it's not that we assume a fixed markup, but there is something a little uh, hokey about the model. Uh, and uh, if, you'll, if you'll notice the way we've done this, you can solve this model sequentially. That is, you can determine the real wage from the conditions of competition in the product market. Once you get the real wage, then you can determine uh, the, out the output level and the employment level. So, uh, Wendy, could you go to the back to the, the picture of the, the, there? In this, in this model here, the division of output between workers and owners is determined entirely by the shape of the demand curve. It has nothing to do with bargaining between capital and labor and so on. Uh, the bar bargaining between capital and labor gives you the shape of the wage curve. So if you want, we have Smith on the horizontal curve, we have Marx on the upward rising curve, but the wage share is determined entirely by conditions of competition. Now, I mean, that's, it's very hard to get a simple model that doesn't have that character. And obviously, if you're not at the Nash equilibrium, then of course all kinds of things uh, are in play. But uh, the simplicity of this does buy into a, I mean, in, in economics, it's associated with Koletsky's view of income distribution, which was, it was entirely determined by uh, monopoly versus competition. And uh, I mean, I don't think we're going to go straight to hell by making this assumption, uh, because the, I, I think the model puts together both the Marx and the Smith aspect of it. But it is, um, I mean, the, the fact that you can solve it sequentially should tell you that there's something really, really simple here that probably doesn't do a good job on, you know, more complex problems that you'd want to have in mind if you're doing actual policy applications of particular policies, which you might want to simulate or just use a more complicated model. Um, just a quick question on the uh, potential title of, of, of the unit. There was consumption there? No, 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 sorry. That was just the title of the talk. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, yeah, no, no, okay. no. The title of the unit is um, The Labor Market and the Product Market, colon, Unemployment and Inequality. Okay, I see. That's a new title. Yes, it's about three days old. <laughs> And the heavy tax is going to be imposed now on anybody who refers to Chapter 9 as the labor market chapter because it's not anymore. That's the tax that I'm going to pay because I have to change all my slides now. <laughs>